Well, hello. I'm with Julie Smith, who is a reader in European politics at the University of Cambridge and a member of the House of Lords. Hello, Julie. Thank you for making time for this. Uh, free movement, free movement. What, how do you feel, Julie, about uh, the whole of the UK losing uh, rights to free movement uh, between, and, and Europe, European Union, losing free movement rights between the EU and the UK? How do you feel, how are you feeling about that today? Very disappointed. Um, clearly, when the UK voted to leave the European Union, it was quite unclear what the nature of the future relationship was going to be. And there were all sorts of scenarios in which we might still have had free movement. I mean, obviously, there are different types of free movement. I'm assuming here the main concern is about free movement of people. And we could have chosen a model like the Norwegian model and said, yes, we still want to have free movement of people to acknowledge that those relationships, the opportunities that free movement has given people have been hugely important. And even if the UK doesn't want to be part of the legislative framework of Europe, free movement of people has been a benefit. But obviously from Theresa May onwards, that hasn't been the approach that's been taken. And where we've ended up is something that I, in a position that I think is going to diminish people's opportunities. You, uh, diminish people's opportunities, yeah, ab absolutely, certainly is. I mean, those opportunities are significant, aren't they? And then they played a role, I guess, in your, in your life as you think about what you've done personally, professionally, politically, and so on. Free movement has uh, been a, quite a kind of key, key element to, to that, hasn't it? I mean, how, what is the role of free movement has played in, in your story, in your life? Well, one of the most obvious things is that I had a Hanseatic scholarship after or just towards the tail end of doing my doctorate. And so I went and spent time in Hamburg and there, were no, there was no red tape about it. After three months being there, I had to register as being resident. But that wasn't anything to do with being British. It wasn't to do with being a third country national. That's what I've, I would have had to do anyway. And so I could simply go and move to study, to live, to work. And that was a huge opportunity at the time. I didn't even think about, I didn't appreciate that this was essentially something, thanks to the Maastricht Treaty, that I had a right as an EU citizen to be able to go and live in another European country. And in the intervening 25 years or so, my life has been about studying the European Union and I can have just assumed that I can hop on the Eurostar and go to Brussels at the drop of a hat, that I didn't have to think, do I need a visa? Or as long as I had a ticket and a few euros, I was going to be able to go to Brussels, to Paris. And I keep hoping that I'm going to be able to go to Amsterdam on the train. But now it's going to be as a third country national with all the bureaucracy that that brings about. And I didn't ever do an Erasmus pro programme. That came in just at the time I was starting to be an undergraduate at Oxford. But I've got former students, family members who've done Erasmus and it's been life changing for them. And that's something that the government's decided British, the UK shouldn't be part of. And one of the really strange things is that if you're in Northern Ireland, you're still going to be able to be part of Erasmus because the Irish government has said, we'll still support Erasmus for students in the north of Ireland. So that's one of the ways, just a very small way, that not only are British people losing out because of this, but we're seeing divisions between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Absolutely, life-changing experiences for a lot of people who've had the opportunity, which they won't have in the future, to study on Erasmus and uh, to enjoy free movement uh, rights, right to work, live, travel, um, retire. People, we're talking about people at the start of their working lives, people at the end of their working lives who have dreams about their retirement that will be dashed. And I think as you pointed out so clearly, it's really not until you start to sort of 
avail yourself of your free movement rights, in your case, traveling to Hamburg to, on a Hanseatic scholarship, or a case when your students and family members to do different things, studying, working, and so on, that you start to realize that free movement is much more than about crossing borders, isn't it? It's about really what happens when you get there and not, have, not, not having a mountain of red tape, for example, and life being made simpler for you rather than more complicated. Why do you think it's been so difficult for people to really understand uh, the importance of free movement and how it, it makes life easier for, for, for us um, in, in Britain? Um, is, it, is it possible to kind of get a sense of what free movement is about uh, unless you've had those opportunities and use them themselves and people have children, grandchildren, uh, relatives, friends, um, why is it that it's been very difficult for people to really uh, value free movement? I mean, European nationals, European citizens, the, the latest Eurobarometer survey shows 81% of Europeans think that uh, free movement is a good thing. But um, in Britain, it was one of the levers that drove people mm -hmm. to the exit door of the EU. We don't want to sort of revisit the Brexit debate, but I just wonder why it is that it's been so difficult to get across in the UK context, the idea of how valuable free movement rights are, whether you're going to use them for yourself or not. There are a variety of different reasons why it's been harder in the UK. One is simply geography, that if you are on mainland Britain, then you don't have those land borders. You don't then say, well, if we just lift the border, we can drive across from one country to another. So one of the most remarkable experiences I had was a train strike. Um, I'd gone to speak at something in Maastricht. I arrived in Brussels and there was a train strike, so I couldn't get between Brussels and Maastricht. And I was told, get in a taxi. And so I was driven right across from Belgium into the Netherlands. And you didn't know where the border was between the two countries, but you began to sense there was a change in the landscape. So you knew you were in a different country. And yet it was all so simple. It was all part of being part of the continent of Europe. Whereas if you're in Great Britain, and I'm deliberately saying Great Britain rather than the UK, UK as a whole, because the situation for Northern Ireland is different. But if you're in Great Britain, it's that bit different. There's more of a psychological gap between just get, getting the train to the Eurostar might be relatively straightforward if you're in the south of England. But if you're thinking about a flight, something that is a major journey, then there's a psychological aspect to it. But also there's been a tendency both for policymakers not really to explain the benefits of free movement. And there's been a little bit of a sense that you talk about Erasmus and there's a general slightly negative connotation for people who haven't done Erasmus that perhaps it's about people just students going and having a good time without really understanding some of the deeper aspects of relationship building, of understanding other cultures, but also without understanding that you can do app apprenticeships through Erasmus, that it's not just something for posh kids to do, it's something that everybody can be part of. But we've never really fully engaged with that. And the free movement issue became, I think, problematic because again, it became about the Polish plumber or the Czech Opera, something about having people coming and doing services in your home maybe, that not everyone was going to benefit from. So used very much by those who wanted to leave to say, look, yeah, some people are going to benefit from free movement, other people aren't. If you've never left the UK, do you really benefit from it? But I think also what nobody really talked about or didn't talk about enough when we were looking at membership was how many of our health service staff, how many of our care workers come from other European countries. They have been so vital to our NHS, a key issue for so many people, both in the referendum and over COVID. And one of the reasons we're having difficulties being able to move patients into the Nightingale hospitals seems to be there aren't enough medical staff. 
why aren't the medical staff? Because actually some of our EU medical staff have now gone back home because they've said, we're not really sure that the UK is the place for us anymore. And that's really sad. I wonder if it's a, a case of we don't know what we've got until it's gone and whether going forward as people start to see the sort of uh, potentially queues and pile-ups in Dover, whether we see those or not remains to be seen, but the shortages of nurses in the NHS in the midst mm -hmm. of a pandemic. As this goes on, um, passports for pets, which we won't have any more. People are very mm -hmm. people are very fond of yeah. their their of animals, and they're particularly of their if they have a pet and they won't be able to travel so easily with their pets anymore. I always thought we should have said during the referendum campaign, vote remain or the dog gets it. We didn't say that. We perhaps we should have done. The dog is going to get it and the cat and all the other pets as well because pet passports are gone. And what about roaming charges? You know, I wonder when people are on their uh, holidays perhaps on the Costa Bravo or if they like to go and trying to download their favourite film or film for, or football match and suddenly discover that it, that, I mean do you think we'll all end up being uh, you know realising at some point that actually uh, life has become more complicated away from the politics the day our day-to-day -day lives have somehow uh, not been made simpler they've been made more complicated and that something might change is it is it a case of we don't know what we've got until it's gone or are just people fundamentally against it do you think i think there might be a bit of we don't know what we've got until it's gone and that anecdote that i said earlier about when i went to germany as a hanseatic scholar it didn't really occur to me that it was easy for me to do because we were part of the european union i was just used to it there will still be hanseatic scholars it won't stop but everything like that will be quite difficult and one of the things that ro roaming charges, I think, were one of the few things that were actually quite effectively talked about in the referendum. But if you don't go abroad, if you never travel, then maybe that doesn't affect you. But something that was pointed out um, earlier today, one of my friends said they'd been to the post office to try and send parcels abroad. And for the first time in many years, they had to fill out a customs declaration form to say what the value was, what the, what the gift was. And then they were told at the post office, but actually we can't send anything to Europe at the moment anyway, because we don't have control of our ports. Now, I think we have at least heard that we're supposed to be taking back control of our ports and our borders and so on. But the idea that we have to go back and start filling in pieces of paper that for decades we didn't have to do, people I think will start asking, well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this is a very good question for people to uh, ask now and in the in 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 the future, and uh, that perhaps brings us to 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 the, the point of the conversation where, uh, as we come towards the, the end of the time that we've allocated for this this conversation on this uh, on this important day, uh, don't let it uh, don't let us uh, wind the conversation up without asking you whether the, in your mind whether you can point to anything. Uh, positive at all, and even though it's a very grey and gloomy day as Britain leaves the uh, Economic Union and we lose our free movement rights as well. Um, is there something that you could point to? Is there anything positive? Is there hope? What would you say? Uh, what have you got in your heart or in your mind in relation to the future that is a little bit hopeful? I think actually the fact that there is an agreement is a good starting point because if we had if we were leaving the european union with at the end of the transitional period with no deal if negotiations after 11 months had completely broken down then i think it would be very difficult for us to find a way back for us to keep good relations with the eu 27 and so the agreement is a starting point the fact that the government has decided to stay in the um, future research arrangements, so beyond Horizon 2020, I think is a positive thing. If they decided to stay in Erasmus, that would have been even better. But I think the fact that we haven't closed the door completely means that we can then take the opportunity to rebuild relations. But one of the things that I think is going to be really important is 
that we recognize that just because the world can speak English doesn't mean that we should simply be doing that. And maybe now is the time to rebuild our language learning and look as well, not just at relations with the EU27 as a block, but also look again at strengthening our bilateral relations with those partners that have been so important over the last 45 years. Think about our bilateral relations, think about our, uh, our languages, our, our language skills, our intercultural skills, an invitation to, to perhaps uh, reflect a little bit and uh, do a little bit more about that. It's a very, very positive uh, comment moving forward. Julia Smith, uh, reader in European politics at the University of Cambridge, member of the House of Lords. Thank you very much for sharing your memories, your reflections uh, on the past, present and future of uh, free movement uh, in Europe and in particular between the EU and the UK. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.